Amen. One more time. Amen. Amen. You always got to do three, right? Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give honor to God today for being here, who is the head of our life, and to the angel of this church, Pastor Webster, Minister Green, deacons, Sister Webster, friends, guests, and enemies, if it be any, amen? Jesus had enemies. He said that if you follow me, you're going to have them, amen? So I can't assume everybody in here today is a follower of Jesus Christ, even though you're in the building. Amen? Now, Pastor Webster said you stand on truth here, right? And that's what we come with today is truth. And the truth is, I don't know your heart. But God does. Amen? So we again greet you and thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm humbled that Pastor Webster called and asked me to come today. He probably don't even remember the last time I was here for Rooted. Now I've been here for the Union, but the last time Pastor Webster invited me, y'all were still in the storefront. How long has it been? Too long. It's been too long, Pastor. That's how long it's been, too long. But I remember he went out of town and he asked if I could come and and to preach that morning and I went and preached and then it was a few weeks later I was doing some handyman work at a lady's house here in, in uh, Edgewood and we were talking and what I do because I don't want it to get twisted when I come into somebody's house to work for them that's what I come to do is work and this lady was there by herself. And so when I come into a home and there's a lady there by themselves, I want to put them at ease and I also want them to know who I am. So shortly after I start talking about God and the lady said, she said, I know who you are. And I said, you know me? She said, yeah. She said, you came to root it and you preached and she even knew the title of my message, and she knew the scripture that I had used. I was impressed, Pastor. She, you remember? Because so many people walk out these doors and they forget. But you never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to see. That's why you have to be who you are, wherever you are. And if you claim to be a child of the king, be a child of the king. Amen? Also want to uh, say good morning to my wife. I'm going to ask her to raise her hand. My grandson Caleb is with me today, amen. And, and I just want to point her out, so in case you want to say something bad about me, and she overhear it, she's going to be very heartbroken and disappointed because she thinks I'm perfect. And if you criticize me, that's going to hurt her feelings, amen. That's my one joke for today, amen. She knows that I'm far from it, amen. Come this April, we'll be married 40 years. 40 years. To God be the glory, amen. What great things he has done. If you have a copy of the scripture, I'm gonna ask you to turn with me to James chapter one. James chapter 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And if you have it, we want to begin at the James chapter 1 at the 19th verse. And we want to read down to verse 27. And the Bible reads, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. 
but for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one would be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You may be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we just come before you this morning again, giving you glory and honor, thanking you for this opportunity we have to stand before your people. God, I pray right now that you take me down, that you might be lifted up. I pray, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would open up the hearts and the minds of your people, that they might be able to receive what you have for them here today. God, may everything I say, may everything I do, bring glory and honor to you. We pray for that one this morning who may be lost and undone. Draw them with your power before it's eternally too late. This we ask in Christ's name. And let your church say amen, amen, again and amen. We want to use this morning as a thought for a few minutes coming out of the first part of verse 22, where it says, be ye doers of the word. I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about putting in the work. My pastor often tells us that ministry is work. You gotta put it in. Now, I want you to understand today that today is not yesterday, last Sunday, and it's not tomorrow. Today is God's day. As Pastor said, it's not Raven's day, it's God's day. Amen. And God knew that you were going to be here this morning. He knew I was going to be here. And the things that I'm going to say this morning is not what I'm saying, it's what God is saying. Amen. Now it's up to you whether you accept that or not. I don't know what caused Pastor Webster to call me for me to be here today. I don't know if God laid it on his heart to call me. I don't know if he saw me in a dream. I don't know if he threw darts at names on a dartboard. I just know when I got word that I was invited to come here this morning and I accepted, God impressed in my spirit this scripture that I'm gonna talk about today. I didn't go to the Bible, I didn't go searching. This is what God laid on my heart. And I believe God. I believe God's word. And so what I want you to understand this morning, it's not about me. It's not about how I present things. I'm not Pastor Webster. I might not do them the way he does it. But what I want you to do is open up your heart and allow God to speak to you this morning. Not looking around and worrying about what everybody else is doing or what everybody else is thinking, but let God speak to your heart. Because he's already spoken to mine. And that's why I'm going to share this morning what I'm going to share. When you start talking about putting in the work, 
You think about this, the, uh, the society that we live in. You think about the, the, the athletes that we, 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 we cheer for, football players and baseball players and basketball players and, and all of these professional athletes. You know what they do? In order to get where they are, they have to put in the work. And, and it's not that, that they just do it one time, but it's something that continuously, most of these players have done it since they were little kids and they've, they've, they've played the games, they've traveled, they've done all those types of things. And now they're reaping the benefits of all their work. In the profession field, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, you got to put in the work. You got to go to school. You got to be educated. You got to, to do these things in order for you to put in the work, to be the best that you can be. This time last year, I was just telling the pastor I was home re re recuperating from surgery. And I had never had surgery before, but one of the, the things that when I was talking to the surgeon, she said, it's up to you whether you have surgery or not. And so I asked her, I said, would you have the surgery? And she said, if it was me, I would. And she said, I've done this surgery over 300 and something times. She said, I'm good at it. Why? Because she put in the work. And so that's what, one of the things that convinced me to have the surgery. And what she did was she cut five holes in my stomach and they stuck things in there. And she was at another, she wasn't even on me, she was on to the side of me looking through a microscope with her hands on some stuff operating on me. Now, now you just don't get that off of uh, YouTube. You know, we're in a YouTube word. Anything you want to know, you just go to YouTube, right? But this doctor's put in the work. And for some reason, pastor, we think that once we come into church and we get saved, that's it. Now it's time to go to work. Pastor Higgins said yesterday that Pastor Webster, when he was on the other side, he worked for the world, for the devil. I'm, I did too. I put my time in. Amen. And the same time I put in there, I want to put it in for God. And so what I'm telling you today is I want you to pay attention to God's word. Listen to what God is speaking in your heart. Because once you hear it, you're going to be held accountable for it. Amen. It's, it's all for me. My job is to give it to you, right? And your job is to do whatever you want to do with it because you have a free will. But I encourage you today to listen. It's not by accident I'm here. Did y'all hear me? It's not by accident I'm here. Again, I don't know how God put it on Pastor Webster's heart. But I didn't just show up here. So God knew what you needed. Amen? This is real. I'm, I'm excited about it, man. I've been excited man, for two or three, four, five, six days. Amen. <laughs> don't wait another 11, 12 years, Pastor. Don't, 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 don't wait. <laughs> Call me back, amen. So let's look at this word. Putting in the work. So we look at James, and James is a, they call it a general epistle. He doesn't really talk to any certain church, but he's talking to believers. And they say James' epistle is, is, is like the book of Proverbs. It's not, not real deep. But he can tell you day by day how to live. He said that he was a bondservant of God. You, you know, a bondservant, everything you have depends on your master. You, you don't get paid for it. You don't get paid for it. So whatever you have is what your master gives you. And he said he was a bondservant of God. And that's what we got to get. We got to be that bond servant of God. So let's look at verse number 19. We, we're going to get through this this morning. He says, so then, my beloved brethren, every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You're here this morning. And what I want and what God wants is you to be swift to hear his word. That means to keep yourself in a position to receive the word. You had to keep yourself in a position. Now, now you hear this Sunday. I don't know if you were here last Sunday or not. I don't know if you were here on Wednesday. I don't know when the last time you was here. But he's telling us to keep ourselves in a position 
so we can hear from God. We can get in that position to receive his word. And he says that we are to do that swift to hear. And then he said, slow to speak. I've heard a lot of people say that's why you got two ears and one mouth. You should be doing twice as much hearing as you are talking. Also, some people look at this when it says that you should be slow to speak. It should be that you should be slow to be wanting a, to be a teacher of God's word or to be a preacher. You should be slow to that. Don't, don't just jump into this thing just because you see somebody else doing it. But he's saying here that you should keep yourself in a position to receive the word. Think before you respond. He says in anger. Think about what you get ready to say before you say it. He says slow to speak. And slow to what wrath? That is anger. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, verse 20. So what he's saying is that you need to be slow to anger because human anger is directed towards an individual. God's anger is towards sin. And most times we're not going about that way because, you know, we don't want to get involved. But our anger most of the time is to a person and not to their sin. It's not trying to tell them to do something better, but it's to criticize what they're doing. Many times we come out in anger, and that's something that I tell you, God has worked with me, and he's still working with me, about anger. I used to be really angry. Now, I just get angry every once in a while, amen. I'm not the only one, right? But what he's saying here, he says, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So no matter how much you holler, no matter how much you scream at somebody for doing something wrong, that don't show God's righteousness. Amen. You're not going to get anywhere when you do that. Come on. Man, I tell you, we've been married for almost 40 years, me and my wife. Amen. If she tells me to take out the trash in a certain voice, the trash don't get taken out. Amen, oh me. If she comes in a certain voice and say, go take the trash out, the trash ain't going to get, it's going to get taken out when I want to take it out. You understand what I'm saying? And so I'm saying, we, we, I'm talking about now, he's writing here to believers. He's not talking to the world, we're talking to believers. So this morning, we're talking to believers. So he's telling us to be, be slow to wrap because he says that human anger is directed against people and it does not produce righteousness. Psalms 119.11 says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word is our protection from that. When we were in the world, we didn't have no, no way to buffet that. Because you're in the world, you're dark. But now once we come into the light, now we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now he's saying that these are some things that you can do. Let's, let's move on. Let's look at verse number 21. And he says here, he says, therefore, if you go back and read the first part of chapter uh, one, he gives you certain things that they've done that, that he's telling you about. He says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Lay aside. When I was in the world, I couldn't lay it aside. When you were in the world, you couldn't lay it aside no matter how hard you tried. But like he said, you have the spirit of God living inside of you. Lay it aside really means having to put off as one does dirty clothes. Come on. What do you do with your dirty clothes? You come home, you take those dirty clothes off, you put them in the hamper, they go to the washing machine, they get clean, and then you can use them again. And so what the writer, is, is James is telling us, he says, therefore, lay, lay aside. We are to take off, lay aside what? All filthiness and overflow of wickedness. I, I know he's not talking about y'all. He's talking about other people. <laughs> no, he's talking to you and me. See, we think. We dressed up and we're cleaned up and we're smelling good, we're looking good. And we come into church and nobody knows what's in our heart and minds, but God does. So he says, lay aside. That means to put off. Filthiness and overflow of wickedness. 
All this is is your sinful practices. That's right. Sinful. <laughs> he got quiet. Pastor, I don't want to say something. <laughs> because what? We're all are the same. We all have this issue. He's not, he's not just saying some. He said sinful practices and thought and deed. Not only what you do, but what you think. And you know your mind better than I know your mind. And you know your mind, just like my mind, there's some bad things that come through it. Especially when somebody rubs us the wrong way. As long as you're agreeing with me and we're walking together, everything's fine. But as soon as I rub you the wrong way, what happens? I don't have a cat, but you take a cat and you can rub him one way, he's fine. But when you go the other way, he gets irritated. Pastor said that yesterday. He said sometimes he gets irritated with you. Amen? That's what he said. He gets irritated. Not that he don't love you, but he gets irritated. We all get irritated. But he, once you get irritated, okay, you're irritated. Guess what? You got to move on. You can't stay in irritation. So what he says, you lay that aside. He said, you take it off like you do your clothes. Many of us don't want to lay it aside. We want to hang on to that. We want to hang on to it. Don't hang on to it. He says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow. Overflow of what? Wickedness. Impure living. Impure living. No, I know we all live good. When I retired from the Army, I moved back to Tennessee. I worked for my dad in the plumbing and electrical business. And I remember one day we went to this church member's house. And we was going to the house, and her son, who was an adult, said, Mom, put your beer away. The preacher's coming. I work from that. I'm a plumber. You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching at the church, but you know, I'm just, I'm coming to work. And this is what she said. That preacher don't have no heaven or hell to put me in. That's what she said. God knows what I'm doing. Whether it's right or wrong, she was right. I came to fix her plumbing problem. I didn't come to condemn her. But he says, lay aside that impure living. I don't need to sit here. The pastor don't need to sit here and tell you if you're living right or wrong. The spirit of God inside of you can tell you that. And what we do in the, in the church is that if it's not written in the book that I can't gamble, I can't do the lottery, I can't drink, I can't smoke, I can't do this, I can't do that, then it must be okay. But you got a God living inside of you of the Holy Spirit that lets you know that what you're doing and he says that now again, he can't make you not do it. But he's suggesting that you do it. And so that's why the writer says, lay that stuff aside. So ever how you living, if you living and it's ungodly, he says, lay that aside. He said, lay it aside. He said, lay it aside. Because he said, why? He said, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save you. Now, when he says lay it aside in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So he's saying since you are a believer, you got to put it off. You got to lay it aside that old man, that old nature, how you used to act, how you used to talk, the places you used to go, the things that you used to do. He says you got to lay that thing aside because he said what happens is that that thing is going to keep growing and growing and growing. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But what happens is sin, once it starts, it doesn't stay there. It grows bigger and bigger. Just like somebody take a, a, make a little snowball. And you take it out in the, in the snow and you start rolling it. As you roll it, the farther you roll it, guess what? The bigger it gets. And so that's what he's saying here that sin does. He says that in Ephesians that you put it off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Colossians 3.8 says, but now you yourselves. Who? Yourselves. Put off all these. What? Anger. Wrath malice, blaspheming, filthy language out of your mouth. 
Now this is what the word of God is saying for you to put off. So that means I have the ability to either do it or I have the ability not to do it. But he's saying put, put it off. Yeah. He said this filthy language, wrath, anger, malice. You know what malice is? Malice is anger ramped up. It doesn't take much, brothers. I know we think we're holy and righteous, and I know we think we're up in here. Let somebody cut you off. Let somebody get in front of you at Walmart, break line. Just, just, it don't take much, I'm telling you. You think you are, but if you're not focused, somebody can, can cut you off at the red light. And your anger just goes sky high, boom. I know I've been there. And if you don't watch yourself, you will be there. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore, we also, since we have surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the writer of Hebrews is saying that, just like I just said, it don't take much. We think we're there. But see, some people know the right words to say, like husbands and wives. We've been around each other long enough. We, we know what that trigger word is, right? We know what it takes, boy. And we, you know, when we get upset, we'll say that because what? We want to inflict that pain. Amen. But what I try to do now is I try to keep that mouth closed. Because no matter how I respond, it says here that it's not going to show God's righteousness. So if my wife, and she doesn't do it, I'm just, I'm, I use her. She don't even like me even talking about her because she gets upset if I even bring her name up in my sermons, but I still do it anyway. <laughs> because what we all live, right? This is what we all dealing with. If you're dealing with a spouse, you're dealing with somebody who has their own mind, their own way, and want to do things their way. And the Bible says we're no longer two, but we're one. And we have to work at this thing. We have to give and take. But look what he says here. He says, you lay all that stuff aside, right? You lay it aside. He says that what? That you might receive with meekness the implanted word. This implanted word means that it has been put inside of you. This implanted word. An implant is something foreign that's put inside of a body. See, you was dead in your trespasses and sins. The Bible says God quickened you and brought you to life. And when he brought you to life, he implanted his word inside of you through the Holy Spirit. Y'all know what a, a, a pacemaker is, right? A, a pacemaker is something that is put inside of you is something that is implanted in you and it's implanted in you for the purpose of sending electrical pulses to your heart and they have different kind of pacemakers depending on the problem of your heart some of the pacemakers they just send out a little stimulus to keep the heart muscles in rhythm and then some of them are if your heart gets out of rhythm it shocks you and that's the way this engrafted word of God is. He puts it inside of us. He puts us inside of us. Sometimes he just gives us a little, a little charge to keep us flowing in the right direction. And then sometimes he got he got to shock you. He got to shock you, get you back. Get you back in the right rhythm. And so he says with this implanted word, with the, and the King James says engrafted word, he says you receive the word that has been put inside of you. You had to believe it. You have to accept it, you need to study it, and you need to nurture it. You believe word here, Rudy, right? So he says when you have that, this is what you have to do with the word that has been given to you. He says we must yield ourselves to the word of God with humble and teachable minds. Is your mind humble and is it teachable? Now you put yourself in a position because you're here. I use this all the time. How many of you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet? You pay at the door, 
You walk in, you see all that food laid out, and then you just go sit at the table and watch everybody else eat. <laughs> How many, is anybody around here does that? No, you pay your money, you go in, you what? You go to the buffet, you get up to the counter, and you what? You eat. So why do we come to church? You're already here. You're already in the location. You already got yourself here. Why come here and not partake of what God is trying to give you? This is not the gospel according to McKinney. This is God's gospel. This is his word. And you are his people. And he wants you to get this today. So look at this now. So we are supposed to receive it, nurture it, study it, all that kind of stuff. And be willing to hear our faults. When I, when I read it, when I was studying that and I said, man, I got to hear my faults. How many of you enjoy hearing somebody tell you something negative? I, 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 I'm not there, Pastor Webb, so I, I don't like people criticizing me. I, I don't like it. So I try to do the best that I can do. But still, sometimes that criticism comes. Used to be on our job, they have these quarterly counseling sessions. And they, they tell you all the stuff that you've done good over the past quarter. And then at the last part, they got to tell you the stuff that you need to what, improve on. And that's the thing, we all have room for improvement. I don't care how long you've been in the church, I don't care how long you've been coming here, we all have a place of improvement that we can improve. And we want to be the best we can for God. We want to be the best we can. So he said, take this implanted word and that, that which is able to what? To save your souls. God's word is designed to make us wise to salvation. Verse 22 says, now, now this, this is the good part here. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What are you talking about, preacher? A doer is someone who works. Amen. If you look up, a doer is somebody who works. When you go to your job, you should be a what? A doer. Because they're paying you to what? To work. When we come in God's house, we are to be doers of his word. That means we are to work. I was pastoring a little church in Petersburg, Tennessee. Primitive Baptist. I don't know if you ever heard of a primitive Baptist. I wasn't a primitive Baptist. And this lady told me, she said, they're going to run you out of here. I said, well, who's going to run me out of here? She said, these old preachers. She said, because you're preaching the truth. You're preaching and teaching. And they don't like that. I said, what are you talking about? The primitive Baptists, they'll get a scripture, and they'll preach the whole Bible, and they do all that, um, yeah, and oh. And I, I, I wasn't one of them. So I was an outsider. You think I was a, a pastor, but I was on the outside. They didn't want me around because I'm preaching and teaching the truth. But what good does it if you don't understand? We would leave church and we go to a setting like this, a union setting, and my kids would say, Dad, what was the preacher talking about? I don't know. <laughs> and if I didn't know, how would they know? They get so far past the Webster, all, whatever they started at, they get over in Genesis somewhere and say, I got to bridge my way back to the New Testament. On, no sound, step by step, scripture, they, they didn't do this. It was foreign to them when I started teaching this. But this is what God's word says. So he says a doer. You know what a doer does? When you hear God's word and you do what God's word says, it activates the power of the word when it's applied in your life. When you hear God's word, that's why I, that's why I said, if God is speaking to your heart this morning, when you do what he tells you to do, it activates the power when you apply it in your life. An example, a credit card. 
You take a credit card, you apply for a credit card, they send you a credit card in the mail. When you get it in the mail, they usually send you something with it. They tell you what your credit limit is, how much money you can use. You can take that thing, it's got a sticker on it. You can take that sticker off, you can look at how much it is. You can take that, and you can go to the store and you can swipe that credit card. Guess what? It ain't gonna work. It don't work until you call that number and you activate that card with your phone or you go online. That card is useless unless it's activated. God's word is useless to you and to me if we don't apply it and activate the power that's in it. He's saying here, be a doer. That means you got to be a worker. When you hear God's word, he says you got to be a worker and not just a what? A hearer. Because he says, but be a doer of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. You have to apply what you have learned. You have to apply it. So what happens is, I got four examples real quick of applying God's word. We go back and we look at Moses. In Exodus chapter 14, around verse 21. You remember, Moses didn't let them out. They're what? They're at the Red Sea. There's mountains on both sides of them. Yes. The army is coming down on them. The people look back and they're, they're crying out to God and say, why did you bring us here? We'd rather have been back in Egypt where we could, we, we'd have been all right even though we were slaves. And Moses told them, said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And when Moses started praying to God, he said, why are you praying to me? It's time for you to put in some work. He told him, he said, take your staff and hold it in the air. And he said, when he did that, what did he do? He did God's word. It activated God's power and the Red Sea what opened. Now you don't believe, you believe the same power God had then, he has the power now. So what he's telling us is that once you hear the word, you don't get the power until you activate it. Now, if Moses never lifted up the rod, the, the ocean, the sea never would have would have opened. That's right. Pull out another witness here. Let's look at this guy named um, uh, Joshua. Joshua chapter six and verse twenty talk about the walls of Jericho. That's right. The word came. For seven days, you walk around the city once. So every day they got up and walked around the city once, the, the armies, the, the band, everybody marched around. He said, but on the seventh day, you walk around seven times. And on the seventh time, the trumpets are going to blow. And when the trumpets blow, everybody shout. It didn't fall when they went around one time. It didn't fall when they went around two. When they went around the seventh time, they blew the trumpets the people shouted, and the Bible says the walls fell down. Nothing happened until they applied God's word in a situation, and God's power was activated. See, it's God's power. It's not your power. It's not my power. It's God's power. Well, let's look in the New Testament real quick. Peter. Y'all remember they was out fishing? Jesus told them to launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a draw. Peter said, Lord, we've toiled all night. Man, Peter was a professional fisherman. The fish was biting at night. He said, we, they, don't, they don't bite in the daytime. Not in this area. We've been out there all night. We didn't catch nothing. He said, let your nets down on the right side. He said, nevertheless, at your word. Whose word? Jesus' word. He says he let the nets down and they encompassed such a great multitude of fish that the nets start breaking. They had to call their brothers over to help load all of these fish that were in the nets. They got so excited when they got back to land, the Bible says they forsook them fish and followed Jesus. Nothing happened 
And two Peter said, at your word. And he let down the net. Then God activated his power. And it was so much that they couldn't even bring the fish in. You got to put in the work. Putting in the work. Last one. Paul was Saul on his way to Damascus. On the Damascus road was blinded. Came in confrontation with Jesus. The Bible says they led him away blind. For three days he didn't eat, he didn't drink, he couldn't see. God came to Ananias in a vision and told him that this Saul was praying and that Saul saw in a vision of a man coming and laying his hands on him and him receiving his sight. And Ananias said, man, we know this guy, man. He's rough. Man, he, he has letters to kill the Christians, put us in jail. God said, he's a chosen vessel of mine. You do what I tell you to do. And says, Ananias left and he went to the street called Straight and inquired about him and they sent him to it. And said, when he went in and he laid his hands on him, he says, were scales that fell off his eyes and he received his sight. He heard God's word, but the power wasn't until he activated by doing what God told him to do. That's how it works. It's not my rule. It's what he says in his word here. He says that if you do that, you have to work. When you hear God speaking to you, he says, don't be just a hearer but also be a doer. And a doer means that you got to do the work. Look at the, at the end of verse 22. He said, but be a doer of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So what he's saying is if you who are sitting here today, if you only hear the words that I'm speaking and God speaks to your heart and you don't go apply it, he says you're deceiving yourselves. This word deceiving is a mathematical term. It's used in, in, in math. And it refers to a miscalculation. Professing Christians who are not content, who are content only with hearing the word, have made a serious spiritual miscalculation. He says if you are here, or you are at home, and you're reading your Bible, and God gives you something to do and you don't apply that in your life. He's saying you made a spiritual miscalculation because you cannot be just a hearer. You have to be a doer also. It's good that you hear. It's good that you hear every Sunday. It's good that you hear for Bible study. It's here that you go for Sunday school. It's good that you listen to gospel singing. It's good that you do all those types of things. But you got to go beyond just hearing. And you got to be a doer. You got to put in the work. Verse 23, he says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Now, now he's getting ready to tell you that if you are one of those types of people who just hear and you don't do, this is the kind of person you are. He says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24 says, for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So he says, if you only receive the word, if you only hear the word and that you are not a doer, this is what you do. He says, you look in the mirror and then you walk away and you quickly forget what you look like. I looked in the mirror before I came here, right? I know what I look like. But I can sit here now, since I'm not looking at the mirror, I can tell you I'm 30 years old. I, I, I can tell y'all I got brown hair, brown gold teeth. That, that's what I had about 30 years ago, Pastor. That's what I had about 30 years ago. But you know what? I can't see myself in the mirror. So he said, if I'm just a hearer of the word, I can make my mouth say anything. He says, what happens is you see yourself in the mirror and then you walk away and you forget 
what you look like. I was reminded this morning of what I look like. He says that you will forget. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in this, he is not forgetful here, but he is a what? A doer. This one would be blessed in whatever he does. Unless a professing Christian acts promptly after they hear the word, they will forget the changes and improvements that need to be made in their reflection and shows them what they need to make. What he's saying is that if you look at the mirror, once you get up in the mornings and you know you had a rough night, right? You got sleep in your eye and you got slob on your face. He says, when you see that, you'll correct it. That's what God's word does to us. It's a mirror. And what it does, it shows us our faults. A lot of us don't want that. Because we want to think that we're all of that. But he says here that that mirror shows you who you really are. So when I looked in the mirror this morning, I saw that I was bald. I saw that I got gray beard. I saw my nose. Because a couple years ago, I had cancer. And I remember when, I, when they told me that, my mind went blank. And they said, we got to cut it off. I said, my nose? They said, no, we just got to take the cancer off. They said, but we don't know how deep it is. So we just got to keep slicing until we get down. And said, you might have to have surgery to restore your nose. So this morning, it reminded me that when I went, they had to make one slice, and it was gone. So I thought about how good God's been to me and looking at the mirror, and it just reminded me that it was just a little slice off my nose instead of my whole nose. Thank God for what he's done in your life. So he says that a professing Christian, if you don't do, see, some of you, God will be speaking to your heart here this morning, and you said, I'll wait till later deal with it I'll wait till I get home I'll wait till next week he said if you do that what's going to happen is you're going to forget and you're going to keep going like nothing has happened and you don't want to do that but he says in verse 5 but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful here but a doer of the what the work this one will be blessed in whatever he does one who corrects In verse 25, this is one who corrects the deficiencies that are present. So make sure that if God is speaking to your heart today, that you correct the deficiencies. That way you can move on with what God wants you to do. What we want to do, we want to skip a step. I'm not going to do it this week, I'll do it next week. But you got to take it now so that you can get it right, so that you can build on that. There's no shortcuts in God. He don't use shortcuts. It's his way or no way. And so when God shows you something, it's up to us to get it right. Verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one religion is useless. If you again come in here Sunday after Sunday and think that because your presence is here you're all of that he said you're sadly mistaken external trappings and rituals and routines won't get it you having perfect attendance here every Sunday that doesn't impress God amen Amen? again why come and you have all of this not me, but this, and leave hungry. And leave upset and mad because God showed you a fault that you can correct, but you choose not to because you just don't want to do it. He says that you're sadly mistaken if you think 
That's the kind of religion you need. Verse 27, I'm through. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. You want to make a difference? He said, this is what you do. He said, visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep one self unspotted from the world. I wrote down faith that is measured by compassionate love and helping those who are unable to give it back in any way. We are to have a type of love That's right. and commitment to those who are less fortunate than us, to those people who can't repay our kindness. When I went for my surgery last January, Pastor Higgins, First Lady, and my wife was in the waiting room. And Pastor Higgins came back before my surgery, and he stayed so long, Pastor, that Sister Joyce sent, found somebody, said, go back there, there's a man named Pastor Higgins, and bring him back so this man's wife can be with him before he go into surgery. Me and Pastor, we was having a great time, and he had to leave, and, and my wife came in. And so I went into surgery. I was in, I don't know, four or five hours. Came out, it was late at night. Pastor Higgins and Sister Joy stayed with my wife, and they took her down. We was in Baltimore. They took her down to the parking garage, and they got her to a car, and they followed her out and made sure she got home. Yeah. And, and the next morning, uh, Pastor Higgins, they, they called, found out what time I was getting out of the hospital. They came and picked me up and, and brought me home. And it, just, it just touched my heart. Yeah. That my pastor took time out to take care of me. I, I'm a kind of person who I like to take care of people. I don't like nobody taking care of me. I'm just, this is how I am. I'm, I'm a doer. But I was down. And he was there to help me. And I kept saying, Pastor, I'm going to pay you back. Pastor, I'm going to take you in first place. He said, Leave that stuff alone. I'm just doing my reasonable service. He said, you want to do, you help somebody who can't help themselves. I'm good, I can buy a meal. And that's how we get sometimes. Somebody who needs a meal can't get a meal. A celebrity walk into the place and they give the whole restaurant to them. That person can buy out the restaurant and we're giving them stuff and people who are in need, we don't do that. I challenge people at our church. Find somebody that you can be a blessing to. You find somebody that you can help. You find somebody and you just love them just to love them. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. You can't do it for everybody. But he says that do for one what you wish you could do for all. John 13, 35, and I'm done. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You got to put in the work. You got to put yourself in a position to where you can continuously hear God's word. When God's word is spoken to you, you have to make a decision. If you apply God's word in your life, it activates God's power and not your power. He says, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what you look like. But you pick you out somebody and you be a blessing to them and watch God be a blessing to you. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Praise the Lord. We've heard the word from the Lord. Amen. Uh, the book of James gives us a powerful word. We thank the Lord for for. Elder McKenney, give him another round of applause for the Lord using him in a mighty way. Be hearers. 
not just hearers be doers of the word amen and he says you got to put the work in as believers we got to put the work in amen he called us for a purpose not just to look good but to represent his glory amen we got to put the work in and watch this he said a key word watch this rooted listen we got to get back in this word we got to get back in this book we getting away from the book we talking about how i feel and what i think and what i experience what does god say get back in this book some of us have put the book down pick up our bibles on a sunday amen you can't grow like that you can't look into the mirror like that we look into the mirror every day before you roll out the house you look into the mirror god says you, you got to look into the mirror of his word every day amen this is the word of life this is where the power is this is where the deliverance is this is where your healing is this is where your help comes from can i get a witness good word brother good word amen we got to get back in the word of god amen get back in bible study we got away from bible study amen the bible tells us In John 3, 36, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. This is real. This is real right now. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. But we who are the believers, we're going upward. But you must be born again. You must come to the place in your life. Watch this. No more playing games. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It says that who rejects his son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Watch this. For the one who stands in need, hell is real. Hell is real. But Jesus came into the world. To give his life a ransom for many. And maybe is there one near today. Watch this. Today is a new day for you. Because the word of God has already pierced your heart. It's the gospel of salvation that saves. And this is the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned. And have fallen short of the glory of God. This is the gospel. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Jesus Christ. Is there one here today? You stand in need of this great salvation. You can only be saved by the gospel. The good news is the only thing that can pierce your heart. Just raise your hand. And if you're in TV land right now, you just hear the powerful word. And the Lord is speaking to you right in your couch, right at home you say Lord save me I want you to call that number on the screen let that person know that today you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior you have received him in your heart anyone in the sanctuary at this time praise the Lord we all on our way to glory everybody got eternal life I know I got eternal life I thank the Lord it's a life that it can never leave me hallelujah Amen. Let's give another round of applause for our preacher. Thank you for joining us in service today. And as always, you can visit us on our website at www.rbfchurch.com as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you have a safe and prosperous week.